Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. As I was preparing this message and going through this, it was coming out of a heart that was so much committed to the truths of this. I, I am to all of it, obviously, as a pastor, but there are certain pinnacles of truth that really define you. And as I put together this outline for you from God's Word, I realized that this would be, if I could pick out, one of the most important messages of my pastoral preaching career. I haven't really put the pencil to the paper, but as a pastor, I think we'll probably preach some two to 3,000 sermons in your lifetime. And every one you're sensing, this is what God would like you to speak, and it's going to be biblically accurate and change the world, hopefully, and all of that. But if I had to select 10, if I was at the end of my life and I had to pick 10 of my sermons, I believe it would be this one today. It's not so much because it's greatly written and developed and, and crafted for you. The reason I believe it's one of the top 10 is because it's one of those messages that I believe that will define who I am and who you are in its application. So if this was to be my last 10 sermons to preach, which it's not, I look forward to being here a long time, but I'd like the Lord to come back any moment. But it would be this message today. I hope you have a Bible because I have you open your Bible and go along with it in your Bible. But I've titled it, How to Profit from the Bible. Now, why would this be so important of a message for me to share with you? I guess because as a pastor and those involved in Christian leadership, and we had a counseling center for a long time, and we do a lot of crisis counseling, I have to tell you that if I looked at a person's life and I was trying to sort out why are they in so much stress and distress? Well, one reason is often because they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior by faith alone. And so that would be one of my 10 messages to clearly articulate the accurate presentation of the plan of salvation so that person would come to faith in Christ. And then secondly, it would be because they might have trusted Christ as Savior, but for whatever reason, and we could go through a myriad of reasons, they have not fully surrendered to his lordship, that he is the master, the CEO, the boss of their life. So they got him as savior, but they don't have him as king or boss yet. And so they still struggle in their marriages, on their jobs and relationships and financially and even sometimes health-wise. And so that would be another message that would be part of my 10 of why we need to make Christ Lord of our life and the essentiality of surrendering to him. Well, I've given a similar message to you all over and over again in this church about salvation being by faith alone and not by works and how that we need to make Christ the Lord of our life, not to be saved, but because we are. But then I know some people that say in their heart they've made him Lord of their life, but at the same time, they have not fully entered into grabbing a hold of their Bible and making it a part of the application I mean, really living the Bible no matter the cost. And so today I'm, I'm hoping that not only will this message somewhat inspire you to say, you know what, I really am finally at a broken point in my, my life that I want to make Christ Lord of my life and I want to do, 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 do whatever the Bible tells me to do no matter the cost. All that Jesus went through, what it cost him everything so that we could have eternal life. If he would do that so I could live for him forever, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, whatever relationship, whatever changes in my life I need to make because of what he's done for me to follow what the Bible has to say. Now, I know that we live in the greatest country in the world that probably has the most Bibles in this country. I believe we have Bibles everywhere, all right? Now, some of you have gotten into the habit now of relying upon the notes or the screen because we provide those Bibles for you there, and that's, that's fair. That's, that's good, partly cloudy there. But if you want to have the sunshine, I'd take your Bible and open that up, put it on your lap, get the notes out there, juggle what you can, and be a student of the Word. When I think about how many Bibles, I went into my own library up in my law office, not the the one that we have at the church, not the one we have downstairs where I collect things, but I have to tell you that I have over 25 Bibles. And then I realized that someone had given me the Logos uh, software for my iPhone. When I turn this on, I have literally dozens and dozens and dozens of translations of the Bible. So some of you, you might not have held up the leather bound book, but you could hold up your little, uh, I guess your Palm Pilot thing, whatever you've got that'll hold those Bibles within you. But the real question is not how many you have on the shelves or on your lap or, or in your uh, technology. It's got to be how much of God's Word is in our heart. Listen to these statistics right here. 
I read that last year there were 500 million Bibles purchased in the world in 18,000 different languages. Now, I'm not there checking it off and counting it all, but the people that are have done that for me to tell you how many people have the Bible that's out there. Yet millions of people are missing the number one thing about the Bible, how to have freedom and then also how to have a blessing, which happens to be the key verse of our passage today. Would you like to look at it? Look at verse 25 in your Bible, all right? Look what it says here in James chapter 1, verse 25. It says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that would be freedom, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Those people that are struggling in marriage and struggling on their jobs and struggling with their finances, they're the ones that are struggling with being blessed. And so we kind of say, well, I live in Hawaii, I'm blessed, and I still have my health, and I'm blessed, and we are. So we kind of do this balancing act, and we think we're okay. It's like the person that says, as long as I have hamburger, it's better than garbage. Well, you're right, it is better than garbage. But if God has the best porterhouse steak out there for you, that real extra blessing that's there, why would you want to settle for a cheap hamburger? Yeah, it's better than garbage, but it's not all that God wants for you. And for some of us, maybe we're just still satisfied with the hamburger. And I pray that sooner or later, that hamburger might grow a little bit in your mouth where you just say, I need more. And maybe he's doing it. Maybe the broken things that are going on in your life right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, there is something more out there. But instead of trying to make it on your own, go back to the book right here and profit from it, from this message today. It will truly help you with it. So let's see what we can do. I'm going to give you three parts of this message from this passage of scripture that I think that if you will take it into your heart and own it and become a master of it, living it out, that you will truly profit from your Bible. Here's number one. I must receive God's word. Look at verse 21. It says this, that we're to receive it with meekness, the implanted word in you. You know that word receive in the Greek basically simply means to welcome. But it's meaning more than just we welcome you. It's like we welcome you into our lives. It's another form of the authentic meaning of the word aloha. When we say aloha and it luau, aloha and all that stuff, that's surfacey stuff. The real true meaning of it is aloha. We welcome you and we love you. We receive you. You're a part of our ohana, whether it's by blood, birth, or whatever. You're part of us. And so when that word says receive, whether it's in the Greek or Hawaiian, it means the same thing. We welcome God's word into us. We receive it with joy. And notice it's welcome in, and that's what it says, receive the implanted word of God. Now, it is true when you've accepted Christ as your Savior, the seed of God's word got you to become born again. And so you have God's word in you. But the real question is, is it really taking root and really growing? And I really wonder about that. You know, James talks about the word being planted, and some of you might be doing some planting now. Carol and I have got, got pineapples in the backyard. She's growing some papaya in the backyard. She's growing some squash and some tomatoes in the backyard. And we also got some grass and weeds going in, going in the backyard too. But now when you do it, I often wonder about this. You get the seed, the perfect seed of God's word, and you could throw it out, same seed, and you throw that out on the ground. How come some seed grows and some doesn't? I believe it's the condition of the soil. And so that might answer the question, why is it that when a preacher can preach a message with all of his heart, prayed up and made sure it's accurate and really give it with all that he has, there are some people in the group that says, man, God spoke to me. It's as if you were reading my mail, Pastor. And maybe a few feet further on the lanai, someone says, you know, I didn't get anything out of your message today. It was boring. You preached too long. I want something more. I need something deeper. You know, why is it like that? It's quite possible that it's the condition of the soil, that the word of God is being flung out there, but our attitude isn't right. We're not really receiving it the way God would have us to receive it. So maybe that's the case. So what I did is I went back to the passage and I started looking at it. What could be some of the aids that would help us to hear it? And so I'm calling them hearing aids to be able to receive God's word. So some of you that are saying, you're right, I'm really not zoning in on the message like I really want to and I really should. What are the things that are blocking me? Well, let's tune up our hearing aids for a moment, shall we? Let's go to number one. Here's the first hearing aid, and that is it's to be careful. Look at the verse. It says, be swift to listen. Now, that's in the context of the word of God being implanted within us, that yes, we want to listen to others, and we want to listen to good people and listen to truth and all of that, but at the same time, listen to God's word. We need to be careful to do that. You know, I find that when I'm talking to Carol... She'll listen when she's not talking. 
when Carol is talking to me and I try to talk at the same time, there's a lot of verbiage going on, but there's not a lot of words being received into our minds and into our hearts. And so sometimes what happens when we come to church, we don't slow down and be swift to hear. Now, I know that right now, perhaps because of the uh, society, when the preacher preaches, we are quiet as we possibly can and keep our kids quiet because that's what we're supposed to do. But merely being quiet does not mean that you're only hearing my voice. It's quite possible that the word of God is going out every Sunday, but you're hearing a lot of other voices. The voice of someone telling you, don't forget to bring this home when you leave from church. Don't forget you've got to put that on your day timer because you missed out on it. Don't forget to do this. And all of a sudden, you're hearing a lot of voices in your mind. It wouldn't surprise me that some of you might even have your Blackberry out and you're sending a text message to someone. So you're very quiet, but are you really listening to the word of God when it's being preached? And maybe that's why we're not profiting from it. Life is okay. We have a hamburger life. It's better than we're always thinking garbage. But we've got to be slow and calm. And in this case, be very careful. Careful. Zone in. We really do want to listen. Second, we do want to be calm. It says here, and slow to wrath and not to be angry and how important that is. Now, I know that some of you might think, well, what does that have to do with listening to God's word? You know, I find that if I have an angry nature about me, I'm angry at someone, I'm angry at life, and I've got bitterness in my soul, that that happens to be part of the blockage where my hearing aid isn't really working. And so we have to be calm. And so I ask you this question. I don't know what your house was like, but was it calm as you got up in the morning? Was it pretty calm as you were getting the kids ready? Was it calm when you were waiting in the car, honking for your family to come and join you? When you got here, was it running here and running there? Were you calm when you came into this sanctuary? Now, I know the music was celebrative, but it can be celebrative and still have a calm, receptive spirit to God's word. So what was it like? Remember, bitterness is a tremendous barrier to God's word, and it's an emotional one. So maybe what we could do right now in your own heart is to say, is what I'm bitter about worth it to clog up my hearing from God's word? Is my bitterness actually hindering me from the very blessing that I want? And so my bitterness is going to keep fighting against that? I I don't know. I'm not here in an angst, but I'm passionate about this message. So I guess I ask you, are you careful to listen? Excuse me, listen. And are you at the same time calm and not, not angry when you do this? So what's your emotional state? Here's the third hearing aid, and that is to be clean. It says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. It's interesting when we talk about things to be clean, going back to the planting of God's word in the garden. The other day, I got the newspaper, and they had a section in there on gardening. Maybe some of you saw it. And in that section, it talked about planting new grass. And we're blessed in our backyard. We have a postage-sized backyard. But in that backyard, we have some pretty good grass. But before that grass was laid, the article said, what you do is you take out all the grass. You take out all of the weeds. Then it says to put down a pre-emergent where you're really going to put some, I guess, poison into into the grass, into that dirt, so that it'll keep the weeds from growing. They said, wait about a week to see if any more pop up. Then put some more down. Once you've prepared the soil, then it said, go ahead and cast your seed or plant those sod, whatever you might need to do. Now, we've done some planting in our backyard for some plants. We didn't do that, but we did this. We took out the old, and we put down these sheets. They look like, like screen, and then we put little holes in there so we could plant the little plants in there. The purpose of that is to retard the weeds. Now, most of you that really want a good crop, you'll go that extra mile because if you want to eat good, you prepare good, and so you prepare for the great growth. Well, that's how it works in the normal, natural world of eating. But God says we need to prepare our hearts so we can really receive God's word. In fact, in this word here that talks about this, this filthiness, is a word that the Greeks got the word earwax from. Now, isn't that gross, kids? Earwax, you know? You're driving down the road and someone's just digging and digging and digging at their ear and then they look at it, you know? That's gross, all right? Well, while we think that's so gross, the Lord is up there saying, there you go, you go to church, you sit in there, but you're still thinking the wrong kind of thoughts about people or you've got anger or bitterness or moral impurity. You've got issues that are going on at work. You're not a pure person. You don't have a consistent testimony. That's earwax. So when you come, you kind of do the obligatory thing. I sit here and I've done my part. And sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking, look at how good we are. We were at church today. We did sing. We smiled. We even said hi to, hi to somebody. But inside, our heart and mind is clogged with sinful earwax, so to speak. So we do need to be clean. So how do we get clean? So I don't want to leave you in that state. Very simple. God says, I know it's easy to get earwax, both sin. 
He says it's very simple. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even right now, before you get up and go out, you can clean your earwax out, the sin I'm talking about. Just right now, while I'm even speaking, say, Lord, I want your message. I want your blessing. I want that freedom that I really have. I feel like I'm in bondage. And so, Lord, I'm confessing right now. I don't know what it is. I don't have anybody in mind. I just want to make sure that when we go to God's word, that we have our hearing aids on. Let's go to the fourth one, and that is to be compliant. It goes back to the word receive again. Receive with meekness the implanted word. So not so much about the welcoming now, but it's the spirit in which we welcome. And that's the idea of being meek or humble or teachable. So in other words, when you come, it's not so much of saying, I want to look at this Bible here to see if I agree with it or not. Or I'm going to open up my Bible because I said I'd read the Bible five minutes a day. In other words, our attitude stinks. Now, yeah, it's good to be in the Bible, but really, is the Bible getting in us with that attitude? I don't think so. So when we come to the book here, we're coming to a holy book, God's mind on paper, God's voice written down. And as we come with meekness, we're saying, Lord, I, I, I'm fragile. I need more. This world is complicated. My life is stressed. I want to please you with my heart. So, Lord, would you speak to me now? And when you do, I promise to, first of all, change my thinking. That's what real repentance is. And secondly, I'm going to change my ways. I want to be like this book right here. Now, for some of you, when you hear that, you say, man, I'm going to be so weird like the world. You will not be weird. Yeah, with the world probably. But with God, he's smiling down and the shackles that's binding you will be broken and the freedom you'll have will be released and the blessings will come. I don't know how, not name it and claim it and all this money and a promotion on your job and the kids get over their illness, but inside there's this blessedness of being guiltless when you come with a meek and proper spirit with him. So you come and say, Lord, you teach me now. Show me what I need to do. Let me learn about you. I need you. I'm desperate for you. And the Lord's up there saying, all right, you're my kind of child now. Now we can go and do some work and make your life what you'd hoped it to be. All right, so number one, we have to receive it with four hearing aids. Number two, we must reflect on God's word. So it's not just, you know, receiving it. There's got to be a time of reflection. And it's very similar to the first one, but a little bit different. Look at verse 23 and 24. It says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, in other words, you put yourself under the sound of God's word, but you don't choose to do it, he is like a person observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. I like this illustration that James is using. He says, boy, what a great illustration. It's about a mirror. And I like it because most all of us looked in the mirror today. But now think with me for a moment. Let's kind of come up for some air here about a mirror. When I look at the mirror, I want you to know that um, I look at the mirror this morning and I shave, okay? Now, I wish my wife was here and she gave me permission to do this, but... When my wife does, she doesn't shave her face, okay? Thank the Lord, all right? But the point being is, they do trim and pluck. And if you ladies know what I mean, say, uh-huh, would you do that? Okay, all the ladies and two guys, all right, okay. There's a difference between that. And here's what I mean. When you are now looking at your face in the mirror, one is what we call a glance, and the other is called a gaze, now, it's normal, it's natural for male, male and female, maybe more female, but male does this too. You're walking through the mall, and you've been out for a while, and you walk by a mirror. Most every person who walks by a mirror, they kind of glance over at themselves. Now, they don't gaze at themselves because they think, well, everybody will think I'm vain, but how many of you, you'll see your reflection off a window maybe, or maybe a mirror. How many of you occasionally take a glance at yourself when you do that? Would you say, uh-huh? A lot more did that. We kind of do that, don't we? And that's not necessarily wrong. Now watch what happens. When I use a mirror, which is the important thing to do, we do look at it as a glance maybe, but if we want to do business with that mirror, we look at that mirror and as we're looking at the mirror, we don't even see the mirror any longer. What we see is ourself in the mirror and the mirror is revealing issues about us that we might have need of improvement. So that mirror, watch it, works on the outside of us. Now, the Bible, as it says we just read, is on the inside. The Bible says when I look into the Bible as a mirror now, this word right here is going to reveal something on my inside, my attitudes, as the kids would say, you got a tood, you know? It's an attitude that we have. 
And so now, true, once I get my attitude adjustment and I get a checkup from the neck up by looking into the mirror of God's word, it will change how I operate on the outside. But this word is going to change us on the inside. It is most likely with people who don't read their Bible or who glance at the Bible but don't gaze into the Bible that they don't like the Bible to reveal what's going on on the inside. That they do have duplicity in their relationships. They have greed on the, on the inside, wishing they'd have more money, more this, more that. Others that are still having bitterness with family members. I don't know who you are or where you are, but sometimes we just like to read it for the simple little fun verses in here or for some of the cute little Bible stories, but we forget all of that was written so that we would change our life by it, so it should reveal something that's inside of us. So I hope that that'll take effect in us. Well, let me give you three practical ways on how to reflect in God's Word here. All right? It says here, He who looks intently into the perfect law of liberty... Now, that word, look intently, is a lot different than just read it. I know, my point is to read it, I got that, but it's really more of a research, and here's where I get that. That word in the Greek, look intently, was the same Greek word that Peter used to describe what he did when he ran to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday. He didn't glance in there, he gazed in there. Who's missing? Where did he go? Is he hiding? What's that cloth doing there? Why is it folded this way? So he was studying that. Now, just as he studied that about the Lord and where he was during that resurrection experience at the tomb, that's what we do. We intently look at that word of God with the purpose of knowing it accurately, for the purpose of applying it. And part of the application goes is to communicate it to the world, to change the world. And so that's what that means. So we need to really get into it and not merely glance at it. Now, I put together here what I call take a step. Now, I didn't have you fill in the blanks because I wanted you to all have the same thing. We teach this in a little bit more in depth when we teach the spiritual maturity seminar. It's going to cover a lot more than what I'm doing and a whole lot of other stuff around it in a notebook that will have about 60 pages in it for you. No charge Sunday. I know that sounds like an infomercial. I'm trying to get you to the seminar to get you to the material to get your life to change. It's all about life change, not just seminar attending. But look at the take a step right here, if you will. This is what you might want to take, cut it out of your notes, rewrite it again, put it in your Bible, tape it in your Bible, and follow this little take-a-step formula on how you could get more out of God's Word. Now, some of you are saying, boy, that's really good stuff. Now, let me give you a uh, contradiction to this. You don't have to use my take-a-step method. There's a lot of others that are out there that are probably equally as good. Maybe there's some that are better. But whatever I have here is probably better than you who don't have anything. So at least take this and begin here. So let's look at it. So when you're reading the Bible, how am I going to get something out of it? I want to peer intently at it. I want it to change me. I know that every time I get in it, I'm going to probably find something I don't understand that doesn't make sense and even worse yet, seem to even contradict what he said over here. So this book is full of contradictions. It'll seem that way because Satan wants to lie to you and tell you that. But there's enough Bible scholars out there today that'll tell you there are no contradictions in here. And that's why you need to stay with the program. So here it is. Question, is there a timely promise? Is there an attitude that I need to change? Is there something to know, a command to follow? Is there an example in the Bible that I need to follow? Is there a sin that's revealed in the Bible that's in my life that I need to forsake? Has this Bible revealed something that God is doing for me or has done for me that I need to thank Him for? Is there a truth in here that I didn't know before that I'm going to embrace now as part of my belief system? I've learned the truth. Is there an error to avoid? A mistake that others have made that I don't want to make it so I don't have to be in bondage and I could have full blessing? Is there a biblical prayer that others prayed that God recorded in Scripture? And so if God put the prayer in Scripture, shouldn't I be praying that prayer too? So there's a whole list of things that might help you if you're serious about peering intently. So yes, reading the Word, but read it with a little bit more leaning into. Secondly, you want to review it. Verse 25 says, and continues in it. I like that phrase. So it does mean to review it, to put it into your mind. A lot of times people would use the word meditate. As I went through this concept of reviewing the word, I came up with these four Bible guys. One is James, the other is Jesus, the third is David, and the fourth one is Joshua. 
Joshua says if you meditate in it, he says you'll have good success. David says if you meditate in it day and night, you'll have good success. Jesus says if you continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples. Apart from that, you're not a disciple. And then James went on to say if you continue in it. Again, part of the being free and the part of being blessed and how important that is. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.